Hi, good morning. I'll be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 to 11. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the suffering of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces, produces in your patience endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope is for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life in itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that we will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially in our relations with you with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on our worldly wisdom but on God's grace. For we do not write you anything that you cannot read or understand. And I hope that as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us, just as we will boast of you in the day of the Lord Jesus. Because I was confident of this, I wanted to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and then to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes, and no, no. But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the Amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. I call God as my witness, and I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. Uh, so as we'll learn in 2 Corinthians, uh, Paul had to take heart in the context of uh, opposition. Uh, our next song encourages us also to take heart as Christians. So please then.
please be seated. Loving Father, we pray as we begin this new sermon series on uh, 2 Corinthians. We pray, Father, that you would speak to us about true radical discipleship, that we may truly rely on you and be your disciples and follow you the days of our lives. Father, comfort us, uh, encourage us, but uh, we also pray that you would challenge us to, to depend not on humans but in you in jesus name we pray amen so when you write a job application don't put the negative stuff up top right like things like not very good at computer skills but i can cut and paste or I don't get along well with people, so I'm best to work alone. Or don't expect anything before 11 a.m. in the morning. Don't put something like, um, I'm a slow learner, but willing to try. Um, don't put that there. Or really, I'm just looking for an easy job. Look, it's best not to put those things in your application at all. And if, you, if they are forced out of you, maybe leave it toward the end of the interview process when they're convinced that you're the right person for that position. If you're putting together a dating profile, you know, don't put the bad stuff in the dating profile. Stuff like, can only sleep with my dog. Won't work well. Or um, things like, if we go on a date, you'll have to pay, but I should be able to pay you back pretty soon. <laughs> Or um, garlic, love it. <laughs> if my appearance shocks you, it's because I pick my pimples. You know. No, I know, it's terrible, isn't it? Don't, don't put that stuff in your profile. Let them discover it for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> in the same way, when you write a letter, don't put the negative stuff at the front, right? doesn't make sense. Yet the amazing thing is, that's what Paul does. He puts the negative stuff at the front of the letter. It might look positive to you, but rest assured, it's negative. The lessons of 2 Corinthians do not fit well with the world. And therefore, 2 Corinthians comes across as a surprising letter. It's particularly surprising when we know that Paul wanted to win back the Corinthians' loyalty. Other super apostles, as Paul calls them, have come in and highlighted Paul's weaknesses, suggesting that he didn't have what it takes. In other words, if you want an impressive apostle, Paul's not your man. If you want power, prestige, and slickness, Paul's definitely not your man. Now, in this passage, Paul highlights at the beginning of the letter his troubles, his despairing of life itself, his sentence of death, and it makes you reevaluate what it means to be blessed, to be triumphal, to be comforted. Paul is concerned that he has lost the Corinthians' respect, they have become distracted by triumphalism, superficies, and they are judging by external appearances. Paul is concerned not so much for his own reputation, but for their salvation. At the end of the letter in chapter 13, he says, examine yourselves and see, see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. There's been all this talk about whether Paul passes the test, but he fears that that only reveals that they may not pass the test. Unless they change the way they look at things, they will not be saved. 
And unfortunately, this is a very relevant letter to the church today. Today, there are many churches that promote attractiveness and power and triumph and winner qualities. In many ways, churches today are like the Corinthians. So it's an astounding letter, but it's also a very relevant letter for us today that we not get sucked in for the same sort of thing, that we not judge by appearances. The kingdom of God has different values and different standards, and Corinthians teaches us that. So today we begin this new sermon series, 2 Corinthians, and it will help us to redefine what it means to be radical disciples. It will help us to look to God for our hope rather than human pretense. It will help us to not despair in our weakness, weakness, but to trust in God's strength and to be drawn to Christ, not any human. It's a great letter. And there are three uh, points to my message this morning. There it is. That's a frog on the left-hand side, and I'll explain a bit more about that later. But three points. God, the Father of compassion. Secondly, the fellowship of suffering. And thirdly, the fellowship of comfort. So firstly, the source of true comfort is God, the Father of compassion. See, that's what the apostle ultimately wants the Corinthians to know. Not him, but the Father of comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. If you have your Bibles there, please open them up or look at them on your phone. Uh, 2 Corinthians, I know if I forget my Bible, I've always got it on the phone and I can look it up there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's also the Father and the source of all comfort. The word translated comfort implies a coming together to console or to encourage. It's like a parent who comforts a crying child and puts her hand out and she says, come here. It's an offer to approach, to comfort, to envelope, to support. Is it any wonder that children call out to mum and dad when they've fallen over and hurt themselves or they have a nightmare at, uh, in bed at night. Who do they call? Mum or dad? And is it any wonder then that we call our father when we go through pain and discomfort and trauma? Psalm 91 assures us, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. The goodness and comfort that we find in our earthly parents simply mirrors the comfort that we find from our Father in heaven. God doesn't promise that we'll never suffer again. In fact, he assures it. What he does promise is that when we do, he will comfort us. He will embrace us. As a father comforts his child in pain and hardship, our Father in heaven comforts us. And the gospel is the good news that we can call God Father. And very few dare to do that. Very few dare to call God Father. They call him creator, a great spirit, whatever it might be. But we dare call God, the creator of the world, Father. It's a relational term. To call God Father is to acknowledge that he is no longer distant and remote but has drawn near to comfort. See, comfort is a term of proximity. Our Father is near. James writes in James chapter 4, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Well, that's a promise, but how do we learn to come to the Father of comfort? And who can teach us? Well, it's unlikely to be the impressive leader who's discovered how to triumph over the struggles of life through his harnessing powers from within. That guy doesn't need comfort from the Father, let alone be able to teach it. 
The sort of super apostle that the Corinthians wanted wouldn't teach them to focus on the Father. He'd teach them to focus on him, a human. We can talk about the Father of compassion until the cows come home, but without the experience, the lesson will never be learnt. And that's why the apostle taught, my second point, the fellowship of suffering. Fellowship means simply to share. We use fellowship a lot. We're going to get together and, you know, have a meal together, have fellowship. Well, it means to share. And Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, Our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. The Apostle Paul invites the Corinthians to share with him. They were influenced by false apostles who were setting the Corinthians' hearts against Paul. They pointed to his weakness. His ministry is plagued by trouble, hardship, distress, beatings and imprisonment. They argued, how can that be the conduit of blessings? Well, rather than driving a wedge between them, knowledge of Paul's suffering should have drawn their comfort. They should have been concerned about Paul and eager to comfort him. But he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that you are withholding your affection from us. See, when you learn of another's suffering, you should be drawn to them, not pushed away. It's not as if their suffering's contagious. Even more so when you are related, brother or sister in Christ. Paul suffered for the church and he suffered that others would know the gospel. What did he get for it? Suffering. What did he get from the Corinthians? Rejection. And in the same way, Jesus suffered for our sake. So our salvation has suffering at its centre. Jesus suffered on the cross. His suffering overflows to us as we now benefit from his suffering. Believers should not be shy about suffering. It's key to our identity. And as we identify with the suffering Christ, we identify with our brother and sister in Christ. Often the job of fellowship is to walk with a person through their suffering. It's a gesture of support. We do it together. I was a late starter for church didn't start going to church until my, I was in my 20s and that was in the 80s do the math <laughs> and we used to sing very different songs to what we sing now we used to sing a song and it's a type of song where you had to look each other in the eye to sing it brother let me be your servant let me be as Christ to you pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. When you suffer, I'll suffer with you. When you cry, I'll cry with you. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you until we've seen this journey through. See, that's what it means to have fellowship. And that's the type of fellowship that Paul was not receiving from the Corinthians. Not only were they ignoring his suffering, they were repelled by it. And if there is no fellowship in suffering, you can be sure that there'll be no fellowship in comfort. If a person doesn't firstly identify with your struggle, their comfort will either be shallow or worse still, absent. My pain is your pain. And your pain is my pain. We go through it together. We share. And what do we learn from a believer who suffers? Are they a burden? Should we think, oh no, it's something else to worry about? More anxiety? <laughs> no. We learn about the true source of comfort, the father of compassion, because their experience becomes ours. Next point, the fellowship of comfort. Verse 5, So also through Christ our comfort overflows the reason we share in each other's suffering is to share in our comfort just as our suffering is multiplied so is the comfort we receive 
The comfort we offer to each other inevitably comes from Christ. We're compelled to comfort each other because we are related to each other through Christ. Ultimate comfort comes from the God who raises the dead, verse 9. Indeed, we have received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that uh, he will continue to deliver us. So the Apostle Paul doesn't deny or minimise his suffering. Indeed, when he went through Ephesus, modern-day Turkey, it was dreadful for him. He received a lot. It felt really bad. He said it was like a sentence of death. This is a personal testimony of the trouble that he went through, but also how he learned to rely on God through that trouble. See, such an experience does not describe credit his ministry as the false apostles were claiming but rather he glories in it Paul is weak Paul has a terrible life Paul is in pain and suffering he's as guilty as charged he's not weakened but spiritually strengthened by such trials through it he learns the most important lesson which is to rely on God that's what happens when we realise that there's no human solution to our suffering, that we're in the hands of a sovereign God. Whenever I go through trials or I'm anxious about something, I must remember to pray, right? I must pray. I usually pray when there's nothing else I can do. It's out of my hands. And so trials cause me to look toward God and rely on him. It's a tough but incredibly important lesson. And how often do you hear a believer say, I just don't know how unbelievers do it. I don't understand how they go through their trials without knowing God and how, without being able to pray. The person that says that has learnt the comfort of God. And the greatest comfort is to know that God raises the dead. What, come what may, even if we die, we know that God will raise us to life. And that's an ultimate comfort. It's never the end for the believer. There is no end for the believer because God raises the dead. And that is what the gospel teaches us, that Jesus died and was buried and that God raised him to life on the third day. He appeared for all to see, proving not just that God raised him, but he will raise us through faith in Christ as well. See, Paul looks to the past and he can say with assurance he has delivered us and is assured that come what may, God will deliver us in the future. God's track record is good. God's track record assures us that he will comfort us. Paul wants the readers to know God's comfort and to rely on God, not humans. And ultimately, his weakness places him in the best position for him to do that. Paul suffered, therefore he knew God's comfort. And if the readers accept Paul, a man of weakness, his experience can lead them to have the same trust, not on humans, but on God. And so we learn to pray, as Paul did, verse 11. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. That is how we comfort. We pray for each other. I think um, recently we, in our growth group, were looking at the question, why do we pray? And God's got all the answers. He knows our struggles. It's not as if we're going to reveal something to him. Um, he's already got our plans, destined, our futures destined for us. Why do we pray? And we came up with plenty of ideas because prayer is effective. It changes our lives. It also shows our reliance on God. But here's a third point. It shows our fellowship with each other because we not only pray for ourselves, but we pray for each other. That's what we do in growth group. What can I pray for? Simple question, but so powerful. We pray. We pray for each other. And Paul expects no 
more from the Corinthians what he gave to them. He prayed for them, and the principal way that they could share was to pray for him. So prayer is an expression of fellowship. The essence of discipleship is to not look inside of yourself, but to look outside. And suffering is essential for discipleship. Why? Because in it, we learn not to rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. In other words, we are to be frogs. Familiar with that? Frogs? Frog stands for fully rely on God. We're to be frogs, fully reliant on God. Frogs. Discipleship 101. That's what we're looking at in this, past, in this uh, book, Discipleship. Discipleship 101 is about reliance. Where is your hope and who do you rely on? If suffering is the path to the, to the greatest discipleship lesson, then you will ultimately be blessed, be blessed if you draw near to God in the midst of suffering. And if it's not your suffering, if you don't suffer, if your life's pretty good, then consider your brothers and sisters in Christ and what they go through, because through their suffering, you will also learn about reliance on God. And unfortunately, there are mixed messages in churches today. They emphasize the triumphal parts of Christianity and leave no room for suffering. They can't deny that believers suffer because they see it happening, but they locate the source of that suffering in their own weakness and their own lack of faith. And they say things, if only you had more faith. So cruel, really, when you think about it. They want their churches to be full of winners, attractive people and positive people because they reckon positivity is contagious. One per pastor whom I know wrote this. She wrote, only good and only perfect gifts come from God. Sickness, disease, infertility or miscarriage are not good gifts and never will be. They never come from God. On the one hand, what she writes rings true. How can God want these hardships for people he loves? God wants better for his people. He wants health and safety and abundance and life. But that's the end goal, see? But sickness and disease, etc., may be the pathway toward that end goal. It's so cruel not to, not to, to teach otherwise. And if they teach a believer to rely not on themselves, but on God, then the bad things are transformed to good things. They might feel bad things, but if the end goal is reliance on God, they're good. Rather than these things discrediting believers, when they're met with acceptance, faith and hope, they show a believer to be authentic. See, the believer is weak, but we serve a God who is ultimately strong. So this is a message that churches today need to hear. About 10 years ago, I had the privilege of meeting with a woman who is dying of mesothelioma. Uh, it was through asbestos. Uh, she had tumours in her lungs. And the tumours were slowly growing and leading to her suffocation. It's a terrible disease. The doctors were doing all they could, but the prognosis would be that it wouldn't be long till she would die. And so we started to meet to read the Bible and to pray together. At the time of starting to meet with her, um, I would say she was a nominal Christian. In other words, she was happy to be called a Christian but it didn't really impact on the way she lived. She didn't want to go to church even. But her disease led her to want to know more, to want to know God and to inquire more. And so we started to read and to meet and to read the Bible and to pray. And over the period of about 12 to 18 months, her faith grew. I almost saw it before my very eyes. 
you know, so I went from saying, um, let me pray to you, to would you like to pray? And out it comes. And, and it was such a wonderful privilege for me to witness that and to see the way that God's word worked in her heart when she, where she moved from what was a nominal Christian to a full-on Christian, a frog, fully relying on God. And it was such a privilege to see. She died eventually, and she died young, but she died knowing and being assured of the hope that she had and the eternal life that she was looking forward to. And at one stage toward the end, I said to her, so um, do you think it's been good to meet and to read the Bible? She said, definitely, definitely good. I've come to know my saviour, Jesus. And I said, and um, do you think um, having the disease, mesiophilioma, do you think that that sort of helped you to be disposed of this thing? She said, yeah, I possibly wouldn't have been interested in this had I not been brought to a time of crisis in my life. And then I had another question. And I sort of paused because I knew it would be insensitive. And I said, um, so do you think you can give God thanks for the cancer? I want to ask that every day. She said, yes, I thank God for my cancer because it's helped me to know something even better. A father who loves me, a father who, has comfort, who comforts her, and she's learnt to rely on God. She went from not rely on God to rely on him. And her illness was the pathway there. And she was grateful. And it was such a pri privilege to see the seed of God work in someone's life and in their heart that way. But the suffering was essential to her coming to the point of being a frog, fully relying on God. See, God's plan for her included a terminal disease. And who knows what God's plan for us is? It becomes, we, it becomes obvious as time goes on. But we will always know that we are weak and we don't need to pretend. There is little strength within and we don't ever want to convince people otherwise. We are unimpressive. That's a fact. But God is strong, impressive, and 100% trustworthy. That is our message, our experience, and our hope. So, loving Father, we thank you for this word in 2 Corinthians. Maybe a tough word. But Lord, we pray that you will give us the hearts and minds to accept it and to learn and to be drawn to you, a father of compassion and comfort, that we may take Discipleship 101 and learn to fully rely on you through life's struggles, that we would see these struggles not as evidence that you've left us, but rather that you're a part of us and we are part of you and we're a part of the body of believers that shares in the fellowship of suffering and therefore comfort. All along knowing that you raise the dead to life because you raise Jesus to life and in his